Welcome to our beautiful Communion Sunday worship. We're glad you're joining us. Please join me in the call to worship. We have come this hour to glorify God, to sing the praises of the Most High. We gather for the cleansing of our hearts and the awakening of our spirits. We gather because the Savior has called us together as his friends. May God write the law of love on our hearts and restore us in the joy of salvation. Come, let us worship the Lord. Please join us in hymn number 403, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Wonderful and loving Lord, because of our weakness, we repeat destructive patterns. We promise to do better, yet revert to our old ways. The cycle of brokenness repeats itself again and again. We know this damages relationships and everyone is let down. Lord Jesus, Break into the old cycle with the gift of salvation. In silence now, we confess our sin. Forgive us and do new things in, through, and among us. We trust your grace to us that we might be gracious to others. In Christ's name, amen. Please join me in the assurance of pardon. The saying is sure and worthy and of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Thanks be to God who has saved us and offered us a new future. Please join us in hymn number 310, Jesus, the Very Thought of Thee.
Testament reading this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and who repays in their own person those who reject him. He does not delay, but repays in their own person those who reject him. Therefore, observe diligently the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances that I am commanding you today. Our scripture reading today continues to come from the Gospel of John, and I'll be reading from chapter 15, beginning at the ninth verse. I have loved you the way the Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my Father's commands and made myself home in God's love. And I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way that I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what the master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he will give you. But remember the root command, love one another. This is God's word as given by the message, a more modern translation from John 15, beginning at the ninth verse. Let us pray together. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing, even acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As you may have heard me say before, I have a little grandchildren, and one of my little grandsons likes to ask a lot of questions. One of his favorite is, what for? Which is his way of saying, what is this for? Or why? We were at the zoo, and we looked at the lion, and he said, what for? He said, to sleep, I think, but mostly we know that he roars. And we looked at the elephant, and he said, what for? And I said, the elephant is the leader of the jungle and protects all of the herd. But then we got home and we went out in the garden. He looked at my husband's tools. And as he looked at the tools longingly out of his reach safely, he said, what for? And we explained that when you grow up, you take care of the yard and you need some extra help. Well, my little grandson learned that he was going to have a baby. He would be a big brother. His mom was having a baby. And immediately, it came out of his mouth without thinking, what for? The big questions that little people ask are often the same questions that all of us have. Why? Why do I have to have a little brother or sister? And why am I here? What is my purpose? And as we talk about great questions that people ask those of us who believe in God, that's a question we always, are, uh, we always come across. 
What's your purpose? What for? And you and I, who have been around the Presbyterian Church a while, may have learned the catechism that says, our purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But that's a short answer. And I'd like to make it a little bit more tight based on our verses here in John 15. The answer, what for, is we are here for friendship with God and with our neighbors. We are here for relationship. And if there's ever been a time when this has been apparent, it is that during this last year of lockdowns, where we're all in our homes and we're learning new things on the internet, but we miss seeing that whole face, not just the upper half. Some social scientists have studied that not seeing a smile has caused more depression than necessary as we are locked into our homes. But even more importantly is the timbre of a voice face to face rather than the computerized voice. The warmth of the three-dimensional person as we walk into a room. It is so great to see people again as we are beginning to come out, yet we're safe. We protect ourselves with coverings and with distance. And yet you know there are some people that are just dying to do more than the air hug. We miss human touch. What for? It's part of our relationship. And there's even been a study recently this week about the effect on our young people, the students that are not in schools. They're suffering from their peer-to-peer -peer relationships, even as we adults tell them they should be glad to have their parents around. Humans are social creatures, and we must struggle to maintain our relationships. Over 30 years ago, Mother Teresa said, the greatest pandemic in the West today is not tuberculosis or even leprosy. It is being unwanted or unloved. We can cure physical diseases, but the only cure for loneliness and hopelessness is love. And then she goes on to say, in the West, there is a different kind of poverty. It is a poverty of loneliness and of spirituality. There is a hunger for love and there's a hunger for God. Mother Teresa says it so well, there is a desire to know what for, to know and be known, and to understand God's purpose for us in our life. We are part of a community, and we read about that in these verses. Jesus is setting up the first community of believers, the church, long before the day of Pentecost. But if you think a little bit further about it, our communities are not just for church. A baby is born to be part of a family. Neighbors are part of a neighborhood. Students get their belonging at school and with their social network. But we people of faith find friends everywhere, and we bring them in to be a part of our church family. This is a place where everyone, anyone, can know and be known. There are several things that friends do for us. The first is to provide confidences, to share. The second is loyalty, a sense of trust and reliability. And the third, of course, is what we're talking about today, is warmth and affection. Those people that their whole face lights up when they see you, and no matter what you've been through together, you know you've been through it and you've made it together in warmth, and you care for each other. We do need friends. I sometimes ask my family, and I'll ask you now, who would be your first phone call if you came into a time of great trial or need? Lifelong friend, neighbor, coworker? I know in this church, there have been those phone calls that have gone back and forth during this past year. And even this week, as crisis struck one family, immediately the prayer chain went out from Tommy, and the whole church began praying. And I am so grateful to hear that we had good news from Lynn Sacristan. Her son Steve made it amazingly. 
she credits the family of God, the prayers of her friends. This is what we're talking about. It's a different kind of friendship. It's not just old fashioned face to face, but it's being there when people need you. And on this scripture, which is Jesus' last evening before his death, he spends it with his friends, the disciples. He's about to be arrested and sentenced to the cross. And here he has his last conversation over dinner with his disciples. And amazingly, he resets the description of their relationship. He calls them friends. And in doing so, Jesus opens up about his relationship with the Father. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a mysterious interrelationship of Trinity. Before there was anything, there was knowing and being known. There was friendship in the Godhead. And at the very core of the universe is a bond so deep that even theologians struggle for words to explain it. But in these verses, Jesus calls it friendship. So, when God created humanity in his own image, God created humanity for friendship, for relationship, to know and to be known. And it is very interesting that in the very perfect paradise we call Eden, Adam walked with God in friendship. There was a very tight relationship. But even then, we learn from Genesis that it was not good that Adam was alone. Alone, he had God right there as his best bud. And yet God recognized Adam needed a friend of his own kind. And so God designed for him a friend, a woman. And God designed us to be friends to one another. As Jesus tells his disciples, we need friends we need someone to be with in times of trial as he was. You and I hear over and over in these verses, love one another. And this discussion of remaining or resting in God's love is that of trusting in that friendship and trusting in God's good plans. And so the Lord says at first, make yourself at home in my love. Those of you who've read the old translation, remember it says, abide in my love. And we love that word abide, but to update it for our children and grandchildren, it's a wonderful picture of domesticity. Make yourself at home in my love. Come on in, sit on the couch. Let's sit and talk a while. It's a very intimate image. And on this, the saddest of nights, the loneliest of nights, Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, says to his disciples, make yourselves at home in my love. Abide in me. It's a wonderful challenge that he could be so comfortable with his friends and encourage them to have the same kind of comfort with one another. He tells them, love one another as I have loved you. Use my life as an example. Be friends to one another. As the Father and I are friends, so you need to be friends to one another. The very best way they can do this is to learn from Jesus' model for them. Up until now, he's been their teacher, yet he washes their feet. Up until now, he's been their leader, yet now he's encouraging them to lead and to learn and to teach others. Jesus is their God. And in the past, they have been students and servants. But now, he has elevated their status. He's called them friends. Not because of anything they've done, but because what Jesus is about to do for them. In intimacy, he is giving his life for them. <clears throat> and he gives them a view into the heart of God. He's taken them into his confidence and shown them how to be faithful beyond even human loyalty. This is what friendship is for, 
to be so reliable, to count on one another, and yet challenge one another to be better. He is pushing the disciples ever forward to a greater understanding of the character of God, that intimacy that loves us as we are, yet challenges us to be the best we can be. One of our favorite movies at home is the movie 42. It's the story of Jackie Robinson, that great baseball player who broke the color barrier in professional baseball. And in one scene in the movie, the fans are booing as Jackie arrives because he is a black man. He shouldn't be there, they think. It's not the way they're used to things. But in an amazing situation, Pee Wee Reese, his teammate, walks over to Jackie, puts his arm around him, and walks him into the dugout. Jackie Robinson later said how important this gesture was. It signaled that he was no longer an unwelcome person. He was a friend and more than a teammate. He could be trusted and accepted, and they could accept him. You and I need to have friends like this, friends who are different from us. It expands the circle of understanding. If you look at the disciples, they are all different from each other. There's a tax collector, there's fishermen, there's all kinds of people with different backgrounds and personalities and ways of dealing with the world. And it stretches them, it causes them to grow. We need those kind of friends and you find them best in the church. In the church, we accept people because Jesus loves them and Jesus chooses them, not because they meet our own need or expectation. And if this world now could pick up on a little bit of that kind of relationship, it would be a much softer world, a less hostile world, and we would grow, all of us, with less loneliness and division. Jesus knows our old selves, our tendency to criticize or divide or to cut people off. And especially now, you see that there are labels that are defined a less warm way of life. But Jesus calls the people his friends. When you and I meet a stranger, it's only a friend we haven't gotten to know yet because Jesus loves them as he loves us. And as Jesus comes alongside in warmth and affection, he lifts everyone up. And he stands with us not in identity of who we've been, but in transformation of our purpose in life. Our relationships will grow us. And here's the best part. Jesus says, it's not just because I tell you, it's not just because at this stressful time I need my friends with me. But he says, friends create joy. Joy is that thing that when we're lonely or apart, it lifts us up and reminds us of not just our purpose, but of God's joy in us. Relationships are about joy. And that's why it's so natural in every culture to smile when you see someone you recognize, even the youngest child and the oldest person sees a face or hears a voice of a friend, and the warmth comes out in the expressions on the face. Yet, by that same token, we sometimes disappoint. Proverbs 16.24 says, there, is a friend, there are friends who pretend to be friends, but there is one friend who is closer than a brother. And this is a reminder that we do the best we can in our humanity, but God is the best friend who comes to us when we're his enemies, when we're down, when we're unlovable or, or in need. Jesus came to us, and he didn't ask us to meet a certain bar. He didn't ask us to do as he said because he needed it. He came to us and gave his life that we would become more like him, that we would be changed and more accepting, part of the reason in the cosmos for relationship and belonging. That gives us the greatest joy, and it gets rid of the sin that blocks our lives. Jesus came to repair the breach with God, our maker, and that is an important part 
of understanding how to be a friend. When we understand the friendship of God and how God befriends us, forgiving us, giving us new life, and promising us a new future, we can be less uptight. We begin to learn how to give that same grace to others. And then we understand that Jesus calls us to be like him, to be giving and forgiving, to give grace, but mostly to enjoy and appreciate friendship with others, to build that friendship wherever we go. Many people see religion as a duty. God is maybe their employer, not their friend, or God has expectations that they're not ready to pay. They're not to be trusted because people have let us down. But Christ says those are all misunderstandings. Forget the part about religion and expectation and meeting a checklist. Instead, be a friend. Receive Christ's friendship and be a friend to others in Christ. And God will work his perfect acts in our lives by the power of the Spirit. And we won't have to be self-justifying or striving or competing or even locked away alone. Out of grace, we receive the free gift of friendship, and we want to share it with others. It's reciprocal, and it goes on and on in a long chain as down through the history based on trust. You and I were made for relationship, and in those relationships, we will have joy. The joy that comes from knowing God and God's love for us, but also from the community and the friendship of faith. That is what we are for, and that is the promise of Christ. Thanks be to God. Please join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
intimate acts of friendship is to share a meal. And our Lord, on the night before his death, shared the Passover meal with his friends, his disciples. We are invited now to share a meal that he has charged us to keep until he returns. This is the Lord's Supper, and it's for all those who put their trust in him. Men and women will come from far away, from north and south, from east and west, of all different types, and sit together at the table of friendship in the kingdom of God. If you put your trust in him, you are welcome at this table. It doesn't matter if you're Presbyterian, but that you trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And so now come and join in the banquet feast of the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we lift our hearts to you in thanks and praise. We ask your presence with us even as we sit together and share this meal of friendship. We know that you call all people into your circle as you have given your lives for all people. And we ask that you would help us to remember the sick, to care for the aged, to encourage the young, and choose all those so that the circle of your love is enlarged. Give us the power to free one another from bondage or, or abuse of whatever substance. Help us to encourage the best in one another with such power that we break the chains of loneliness and despair. Send your spirit to this congregation. Help us to fight the powers of greed and lust, envy, hate, and bitterness, and all those things that would imprison us even this pandemic. We thank you for the improved vaccines and the ability to get out, and we ask that you would continue to heal those, not only those who have been ill or who have lost loved ones, but the young and the old from the shackles of loneliness and sadness, of being cut off from others of their best friends. Grant to us the opportunity to provide healing and wholeness to welcome others into our circle. And Lord God, we remember those in power. Ask that you help them to see this as a service, not just to one community or country, but to the whole world, that all of us would, like you, begin to respond to one another with sensitivity to the understanding that we were made for you, that we were made for relationship, Protect our families, our children, our parents, our grandparents, and protect those around the world who are striving to build positive relationships with others. Lord God, watch over all of us, we pray. We give thanks for answered prayer, and we ask that you be with us this day. We pray as Christ taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we come to this meal, I encourage you to get your bread prepared, have your juice or wine ready. We will share together from a distance this meal of the people of God. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples as I ministering in his name do for you. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the wine and he said, this wine is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you prepare yourselves for the coming kingdom 
of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus is the bread of life, and this is the cup of salvation. I encourage you now to take and eat as you are able. This is the joyful feast of the family of God, the friends of the Lord we share together. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us by your love. You have shared yourself with us in intimacy, and you have now fed us, fed us with this bread and this wine. Lead us through each day that we would follow you closely and welcome new followers that the world would be a world of peace. We pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and every day. Amen.